get started. Good morning. Uh, my name is Gautam Kumar and uh, welcome again to the Fellows and Young Practitioners Forum. On behalf of uh, Dr. Dave and the C3 Organizing Committee, it gives me great pleasure to welcome our uh, esteemed panelists. And uh, today we have uh, myself uh, from Emory University and the Atlanta VA. You have my colleague, Dr. Sachdev uh, from the Atlanta VA. Uh, you have uh, a uh, good friend of ours, uh, Goran Olivkorna from uh, Lund University, who has joined us uh, for this. Goran, what well, nice to have you. Uh, and we have Kusum Lata from uh, Sutter Health in California joining us as well. Nice to have you again, Dr. Lata. Excellent. Um, now, without uh, a whole lot of things, we got a really exciting schedule lined up for us with five cases. And uh, we're going to take our time to discuss it. We've got a good uh, hour and a half to two cases, uh, to two hours to discuss five cases. And, uh, you know, let's keep the interaction free. As for the uh, participants who are following us uh, on the chat uh, and the attendees, uh, feel free to type out questions and uh, we'll answer them as we go along. Uh, now, I would like to uh, first take this over to Malaysia, where we have Dr. Netu Win, who's an interventional cardiologist in the National Heart Institute, IJN, Institute Jantung Malaysia, uh, to, uh, sorry, into Institute Jantung Nagara, Malaysia, uh, who will be speaking uh, on, am I too young to get a myocardial infarct? Dr. Wynn. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Can you see my screen? Yes. 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 All right. So I'm um, good. Good morning, everybody. This is a such a, such a pleasant mornings in the U.S. So here is a quite a good time in the middle of, at about 9 p.m. in Malaysia. So today my presentation is about the young people, young guys who came for the myocardial infarct. So how young is young? Everybody thinks we are very young, right? So how young is young? young? Let's see all my patients. This is a 17-year-old gentleman. He came with a chest pain while driving a motorbike. So he went to the nearest hospital, which is a non-PCI capable center. So he has a, when they ask the history, he has a, no, no underlying medical illness. He is an active smoker for five years. However, this is quite young to start the smoking in this young man, so, right? So, and then they did the ECG shows there is a ST elevation in leg one and AVL and the corresponding ST depression in, in inferior legs and anterior legs. So they decided to thrombolyze the patients with their tenetac place 40 milligram. After that, they found out that oh, ST elevation resolved and the patient was stable. Now, however, he, they suggested him for early coronary angiograms in the nearest center. However, the patient is not very keen. And then the, he was following up for two months. However, he, the parents also noted that he is having chest pain and it lo looked like a bit reduced effort tolerance. So finally, they convinced him to do the coronary angiogram. Okay. So this is a, and then he came to our my center and then we did the angiogram. Sure, there is a angiogram and an RCA is normal. You can see that dominant RCA. Circumflex is quite is normal also. However, we can see there is a state in in spider view. We can see there is a oh, something not right in this called a view. So then we see in a cranial view, epicrania, and then aleocrania. So sure, there is okay long diffuse dissection from the proximal LED all the way down. So this one is a type one coronary artery dissection. The most likely cause in this age could be the spontaneous coronary artery, artery dissection. So at that point of time, we stop for a while and then we bring in the parents, even the patients, we explain the disease and then, so we give the option whether it is conservative management or going for bind bus or PCI. So in this patient is ongoing chest pain on and off. So we give, the, we, we should do something for this patient or whether we should wait until another few months and bring him back to do the angiogram, uh, angioplast, angiogram again to see the resolution of the dissections. And then the family and patient also keen to proceed for the PCI. So, and then what we do, we wire down to LED and diagonal. So the firstly, the wire go one into the diagonal smoothly. Okay, fine. And then after that, uh, LED very, very meticulously bring, bring down the wire to the LED. You can see that over oh, some part, you can it go in, one into the dissection plane I did the wire is not 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 acting properly and then it looks quite strange so however the wire went in quite smooth after that we wanted to do the 
OCD for these patients. However, the flow is not so good. And then OCD image would, would it be good because of the contrast will not go down. So then we balloon a little bit today with a small balloon in the proximal LED. And after that, you can see that after with a small balloon, there's no flow in the diagonal. Okay, fine. So we use the same balloon to one down inside the diagonal and we balloon again. Then, so we open up the diagonal with this. After that, we use the OCD to see the characterization of the dissection and whether my wire is in the correct position or not. So we can see that OCD, OCD run. So let me run again in the, from the text, from the distal part. So there is a long dissection with some clot in the proximal LED. Looks like white thrombus, doesn't look like the new thrombus. Left main is okay. So what we do, next step. Now this is a OCD still image. We can see there's a dissection flat in the mid LED and the proximal part also there's a thrombus there. So what we do, so we decided to do the DK crush for this patient because uh, these young people, if we leave the diagonal, diagonal is a quite a big branch. If we leave it alone, probably that's, this might close off after we stand the LED. So, we plan to do the up, up front two stand strategy. So we use the Averolimat eluting stand 2512 in the first diagonal. And then with the minimum protrusion, and we crush with the 3515 balloon in the LED. Then we did a kiss, and after the fast kiss, there's a good flow in the good flow in the LED and D1 back. And then after that, we decide we wire back to the diagonal with a new wire and then the standard there. LED until the cover until the ostium because we worry that there's something left in the proximal, proximal LED and it might extend to the left main, it might, might cause a problem. So then we decided to cover the dissection flat from the proximal part. So we use a 30, so 30, uh, 30, stands and then we put one with a high pressure with the, with the, with the pot after that. We, we, we rewire back to the diagonal. At that point, is that as the same scenario in the DK crush there because there are so many stand strokes, strokes in there at the at the or ostian of the G1. So then a bit difficult to one in the balloon. So firstly, we try the two O balloon cannot go in, cannot cannot cannot, cannot go in. So we decided to use a one O small balloon to one in, and then we dilate there. Ostean of the diagonal first. After that, we use a two fight balloon to make the to, to open the ostean of the diagonal. And then a second step is a kissing balloon and C three O in the LED and and C two five twelve in the G one F twelve ATM. So this is a kissing balloon open well. So that is a C. You can see the flow. Oh, so flow is quite good. We want to stop. At the time we see that image, we can see there is a, in the proximal part of the stand, show some staining there. So in next view, you can see there is a stain staining there. Oh, probably might be the clot. Firstly, we think, oh, okay, this is probably the extension of the dissection with the formation of the clot or not. So we run an OCT. So this, there's an OCT run, we can see. So the, we can see in the distant LED, stay got there dissection flap this day to the stands. However, we are not planning to extend the stands up because this it will be very long stands. And then if there's something like instant restenosis or something if that happened again for this young man, we should give the chance to implant it. See for, for the graph. So there's a bit of protrusion of the clot in it. A protrusion of the plug in it. Stands, we can see this part. Bifurcation is open very well. Let's see them area of interest. So this part, okay, we can see that this part, there's a clock here. There's a clock here in the proximal LED. So this is a what, very obvious thrombus here. So fine, oh, this thrombus is maybe stand edge dissection or just formation of the clock. We can see there is a clock. So what we did is, we did there, we plan to, did do the thrombus 
I mean, we, this is another OCD still image. So there's a clock in a proximal LED. With, this is within this within a stay within a stand. The stand is well expanded and then well opposed as well. So this step out of this step out of the LED is the stick of uh, stick of remaining dissection. However, this dissection is not flow limiting, so we are not planning to put this new stand. So this is a 3D image image at the bifurcation of, of the LED and diagonal. The bifurcation is quite opening a bit, but a little bit, a little bit of protrusion at the ostium of the LED, the ostium of the diagonal. So then we, what we did is, firstly, we use a thrombus, thrombus star to aspirate the clot. All of us take out the clot. And then we use a bigger, a bit bigger a thrombus aspiration catheter and then use the NC25 to crush the clot. After that, we aspirate it two times. Feel like the, the clot, like on the right, right, right side, we can see there's a, the clot is quite improved. There's no, no obvious clot left. And then we give the glycoprotein 2 p 3 inhibitor, IV2 fibrin, all and stones, and then the flow was improved and the patient was quite stable, no chest pain. So we decided to stop the procedure and we gave the I subcat enough subbrain for the few days in the ward. And then we monitor him closely. We monitor the ECG every day and the cardiac enzyme every day. And then in one week later, we did one study. Okay, and no more thrombus here. Okay, LED flow is good. So it's still got dissection, but looks like improving. So we plan to stop it. And then we, because of this young man, we don't want to put any new stand. We don't want to do any wiring. So we just stop this procedure. We monitor him closely. We follow him, follow him up quite regularly. And then one is, this procedure was done in early 2020. So until now, I call him. He's quite stable, no chest pains, and then functioning very well. Ejection fraction also okay, stable. So this is a <clears throat> scenario of the patient. So what are the landing points in these patients? So there's a, we can see that spontaneous coronary artery dissection, there's no randomized studies. So most of the study are cohort studies and a case series only in these many, many years. However, we, are, we don't have any definitive treatment plan for whether it is conservative management is the best or PCI would be better or CABG. In, in my particular patient, if you ask me to think back again, so we, are, we might leave him with the conservative management will be the another good option for this patient with the optimal medical therapy. Or oh, another thing is a PCI is a good option, like what I, we have done. So the procedure is like quite challenging and a lot of uh, trauma formations. Luckily, there's no propagation of the dissections. The one good thing is that the CABG is not the option for this young man because he's very young. So if the CABG, if graph failure will be quite difficult to do the restudy, re, re, to, do, to do the CABG again. So, so my learning point is that this is another chance is the high risk or high risk for procedure. Difficult to decide the landing zone for the distance edge for this kind of patients. The slow, slow flow can happen anytime because of the thrombus protrusions. So we this we give the we use a cutting balloon and we use a GB two B three three bit inhibitor to dissolve the stents. Uh, on the other, in addition, the intravascular imaging, particularly OCD, is facilitated for the characterization of the lesions, the wire locations, and then optimization of the stents implantation. Basically, because the, the another issue with the Spontaneous coronary artery, artery dissection is that it can cause the underestimation of the vessel and can cause it. We put a small stent and can cause that the stent will be hungry if the, the dissection has resolved. There's a high risk of stent thrombosis as well. So, this is end of my presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for your great presentation. Um, I had a couple of questions. Could you go back to the initial presentation of this case? All right. You want to see the angiogram? No, no, the very first uh, clinical background, sir. All right, all right. Perfect. So the time duration between the STEMI presentation and the angiogram was two months. Yeah, and, two months. Uh, two months, you know, the flow has still norm uh, normalized. What were the cardiac biomarkers when he came back two months later to see you guys? Uh, cardiac markup is not very high. A little bit, I mean, not, uh, we use the HS troponin is a, I remember it's about 20, not okay. very high. And what about the echocardiogram when he came to see you? Did he have normal wall motion? Uh, not really. Ejection fraction is poor and about 40% with the anti uh, reduced wall, wall motion and anterior wall. And okay. the yeah. I mean, this is, uh, 
this is a difficult scenario. While it's easy to, in general, for SCAD, we tend to favor conservative management. And I think most of our panelists will probably agree. The problem in this case, which is a unique issue, is that it has been going on for two months. And you know, you can make an argument that yes, you have already tried a conservative management. And uh, this is what uh, you're dealing with at the end of two months. And that's what I'm not, I'm not saying that, oh, we should definitely do PCI or not do PCI. But that makes this case a little bit more difficult and complicated and not your garden variety scared where you know the presentation is a little bit more acute. So that's yeah. one point. Uh, the second point with these CADs that you raised and illustrated very well, if you go to the next image, uh, go forward to please. When you balloon the LED, you notice that the diagonal uh, shuts down. Yeah, next yeah, image. That yeah, that's the image. Where the moment you balloon the LED, the diagonal shuts down. This is something that's fairly unique in the pathophysiology uh, of SCAD, uh, in the sense that it is now believed that it is not the dissection in the lumen that starts the process rolling but actually more uh, intramural hematoma from the vasa vasorum bleeding that actually starts the intramural hematoma. And thus by ballooning it, you are then basically doing what is called a toothpaste tube effect uh, inside the vessel. And, you know, I think that kind of makes uh, SCAD, uh, you know, a difficult disease to deal with because even after you do that, you're kind of, you know, squishing the uh, thrombus uh, in the wall down distally and proximally. Uh, now, where at what point did you use the cutting balloon? Did you use it inside the stent? Uh, yes, I think we, we use inside the stent after the clot is there. So there's okay. like one, yeah, at the, so at the final, you, before, the, before the final image, yeah. Before the final image. So one of the things I wanted to throw to my esteemed panel is that have they considered in any case of using the cutting balloon in the de novo vessel Kind of, you know, making a little slit to letting the uh, the blood kind of come out, so to speak, much like you drain a hematoma on a scalp or something like that. Would that be a reasonable thought? I'll throw that out to the panelists. That's a little bit more out there in terms of the question. And my last comment that I wanted to make is that in terms of post-procedural care, has this patient been checked for fibromuscular dysplasia in the sense that has he got a CT abdo pelvis? and a CT of his head. Now I will keep quiet. I have said enough. Uh, actually, we didn't do the, for this uh, fibromuscular dysplasia, dysplasia screening because there's no family history as well. So if some of the screening is quite expensive. So they, we didn't proceed for the procedure. Okay. Uh, rest of my panelists, uh, anyone? So I mean, we know about, I'm sorry. We, we, we know about that this is an option uh, to cause a fenestration using a cutting balloon. Uh, I've never tried it personally, but uh, I, I know it, it's an option to do so. Uh, another comment that I had was that uh, I think you need to be very careful about using OCT in a patient with, with uh, SCAD because you can extend the, the dissection. So I would tend to favor IVUS over OCT in this situation. So few questions, you know, uh, the dissection was pretty extensive and going up to the apical part of the LED. So I'm sure that when you wired distally, because as you wired a little bit distal, there was a little bit difficulty in the wire, probably going into the dissection plane. So we have to be always careful that distally you are in the lumen. And uh, was it just a feeling or did you inject it distally and make sure that you are in the lumen? Because it was going till the apical LED. And yeah end up uh, uh, like you know especially in the apical part of the led and distal part of the led you can end up stenting somewhere if you're not sure i see because i think we didn't do any micro catheter injection for this patient we just i just used with the field basically and my second part of the question is this is a great case and of course you were struggling with this young guy whether we should do anything or just leave it because uh, 
whatever we did like you know we did, like you know as an intervention cardiology we we do it like for some for the patient and of course we worry about the outcome but do you think whatever we did made a difference in patient outcome yeah that is very difficult situation here yes. so we yes. so so we did management or pci or cbg we need to think at that point so conservative management and we call him back that is that one option lah basically however if he got an extensive infarct again again within this few months is another thing we will feel regret about that with that another thing is if we put the stand okay fine we put the stand whether it might improve his father outcome or not so because is uh, might happen within few years let's say if he continue smoking or he not controlling his lifestyle so that one will be another difficult scenario also so I, it was I, yeah, yeah i'm not criticizing this case i'm just trying mm -hmm. to understand that should because this is a very common scenario surgeons usually say no eyeball test this one i'm not going to do it no good outcome so we are a little bit on the little bit different side and of course like we try to do whatever the best for the patient but should we do anything or just leave it and then talk to the patient this can extend because even the putting the stent i'm not sure this will extend proximally or and then we will do anything because when you like you know the later on you do the angiogram of course the flow is pretty much the same what you had the first time then the second thing is i'm sure that they must be aware that putting this stent and it's still it's not going to salvage the issue completely and i agree with gotham that this patient require usually i do head to toe ct scan because you know brain aneurysm and anything can be very fatal and i know it's it's expensive but that's what at least you should give the option to the patient all right i agree with uh, uh, kusum uh, i think uh, uh, after the angiogram uh, after knowing that there is a flow there there has to be a good regimen of medical management uh, you know since the initial uh, you know stemi which he presented was treated and with the resolution of uh, st segment uh, there is evidence that you actually were able to get the artery flowing back again i think from the word go is a 17 year old starting with chest pain this is going to be most likely scap so um i think that is uh, very important to actually give young patients a chance to heal this is a very extensive dissection it is not expected that it will heal in two you know two months i think you just have to seriously follow and see how things are rather than just you know seeing doing an angiogram and then reacting to the angiogram because uh, uh, the kid is having uh, uh, angina uh, there are obvious reason why he's having angina and i think uh, since the dissection is extensive and goes all the way to the distal lady in your final angiogram you can still on a oct you can see that dissection is still there uh, it is not you may be able to actually seal the inlet but the outlet is still there uh, and uh, one of the angiograms which you showed and the uh, the thrombus which is there you can see the left main some of that hematoma is actually squeezed towards the left main there is a narrowing the distal left main uh in one of those cranial views um lucky that nothing happened but this is what is the risk you take when you actually you know start intervening on a scab you know there is extensive dissection and you're trying to stent it you're going to actually is a good possibility you can do more harm luckily in your case that you are able to pull through and uh, his flow is still maintained and his arteries are all the branches are still there and i think as a fellow one thing also it's important to remember that uh, like you know of course you will do case by case basis but we don't have to expedite the death that's really important and that means that we don't have to do always everything and i saw that left main coming out of that and even though you think that you have stented the inlet this is a vascular issue so it's not like we stented and proximal to that it will not happen it can even goes up to go up to aorta 
So it's a it's not dissection of the stent, which proximally if we stent it, we, it's not gonna go. It, it can come back again and then just dissect the entire vessel. Thank you very much. Um, and just uh, that's a great presentation. Thank you so much uh, for presenting it. You know, it's a, it's a difficult challenge, uh, and uh, you know, it's uh, I mean, the consensus for most of these cases is you know to not do anything. But you know, when you have the patient sitting in front of you, I think, I think that's tough. That's a difficult one as well. I mean, we we appreciate that. I mean, it's why as uh, the, my other co-panelists said, I think uh, individualization of these cases uh, is very important with uh, a strong preference given to conservative management, really. Um, thank you so much. If you can unshare your screen, all right, we can talk about our next presenter who is uh, Dr. Ayman Ben Abdul Salam. And he is uh, from the Fahad Hashid Public Hospital Department of Cardiology. Uh, and he is going to tell us about reverse T and protrusion in distal left main restenosis with cardiogenic shock patients. And this is from Tunisia. So we have uh, crossed across the world from the Far East uh, to now uh, North Africa. <laughs> so th thank you. Uh, first, I would like to thank you for this uh, opportunity. I'm very, uh, it's a pleasure for me to present this case. I'm uh, Dr. Ayman Abdesali. I'm an interventional cardiologist at Farhad Hashid uh, Hospital in Sousse, Tunisia, and an assistant professor of cardiology at, at Sousse University. So uh, my case is about a 65-year-old male. He's an active smoker. He has uh, peripheral arterial disease. In 2017, he presented with an anterior STEMI, complicated with uh, ventricular fibrillation, cardiac arrest, and cardiogenic shock. Uh, hopefully, a successful primary PCI uh, was done, and, in the, uh, and the proximal LAD was stented, and the patient uh, did well and had uh, favorable outcomes. So he remained uh, symptom-free, but three years later, he uh, was brought to the emergency one hour after the onset of chest pain. So blood pressure was dramatically low, heart rate was 86 beat per minute, uh, oxygen saturation was low on room air. He had cool skin, mottled extremities, no heart murmurs, but obvious rail on pulmonary examination. So he was clearly in a, in a cardiogenic shock. This was his EKG with a diffuse ST depression in uh, all the leads and uh, an ST elevation in the AVR. So uh, patient got uh, uh, AV infusion of inotropes. Uh, uh, loop diuretics and uh, non-invasive ventilation, and uh, he could be stabilized and uh, brought to uh, the cath lab for an emergent PCI. So this is uh, his angiogram uh, showing uh, a patent RCA and uh, diffu a, a, a proliferative restenosis in the proximal LED with uh, a tight stenosis in the ostium of the cerf with a, an uh, occluded uh, obtuse margin. So uh, we did the PD dilatation first. Flow got slightly better. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have uh, coronary imaging. So we have only clear stand. So I used the uh, clear stand to see, uh, to better understand the situation. And uh, what we found is uh, that the, the stand was uh, positioned in the distal left main across the ostium of the cerf with the uh, areas of uh, under expansion, as uh, is shown is in this image. So what strategy in, uh, in this patient? We have a true distal uh, left main bifurcation uh, with severely diseased side branch and severe uh, instant restenosis in the, in the LAD. So uh, for me, uh, the choice was an upfront two stent technique, but uh, the problem was which, uh, which technique to choose. The side branch was severely diseased with a layer of stent across the third ostium. So the axis, uh, I had uh, serious concerns about uh, further access to the, to the circumflex. So technique that I would uh, choose are the techniques that would secure the side for branch first. So uh, I thought about pulot technique, decay crush technique, 
but the problem is that they will end up with uh, three or more layers of uh, stand strut and the distal left main. So, and uh, also both techniques are time and device consuming with uh, a serious risk of, uh, of not achieving a final piecing uh, balloon and the good result. So this was bad ideas for me. And since the angle of the bifurcation was wide, I chose to do a reverse T and protrusion technique. This is a simpler technique with only six steps. And uh, as, a, as, is, as it is illustrated in this uh, paper. So first I positioned the, the stent of the surf first. Uh, with the minimal protrusion in the, in the proximal LED, uh, deployed the stand and then did the first kissing balloon inflation, then uh, positioned the, the second the drug eluting stand in the proximal LED after, uh, after pre dilatation with the NC balloons to make sure that the stand will expand well. And uh, this is the stand expansion. Then uh, I was uh, with the radial access and the uh, extra backup catheter wasn't uh, coaxial since the uh, left main have a down uh, uptake. So I, I, I was with the jet instead. So the support wasn't uh, optimal. So I used the encoring uh, balloon technique to advance the, the mice, uh, NC balloon in the circ. This is the clear stand for the first, uh, the, the final kissing. And this is uh, the result. This is the clear stand after the final kissing with the good, a better expansion of the of the stand of the cert, and this was the final result uh, with the good uh, flow in the cert and the LED, and the obtuse marginal was uh, reality uh, spastic, so it, 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 uh, the flow was well after uh, after uh, IV infusion of uh, after nitro in the intracoronary nitro. So what I learned from this case, choice of the bifurcation technique should be tailored to every anatomy and uh, every situation. We should always keep it simple, safe, and swift uh, to overcome these uh, scenarios. And uh, I would uh, availability of mechanical support and intracoronary imaging would make the, the case uh, easier, less stressful, and uh, the result more optimal. Thank you for your attention. Well, uh, that is great uh, presentation. Uh, I got uh, a few questions. Uh, so what is in your mind is the culprit for uh, uh, the ST elevation in um, uh, one and AVL? Um, and what do you think is the reason for cardiogenic shock in this particular patient? I think uh, <clears throat> the distal left uh, the distal left main lesion is is the, the culprit, but uh, and the uh, proximal LED. So the flow, um, the flow wasn't good in the left circ and the obtuse marginal and in the LED. So I think it's the distal left main that made the, the patient uh, came in a uh, common cardiogenic shock. So uh, as you showed your first angiogram. Uh, which you can actually go back and show us again. Um, in that particular angiogram, what I am able to see is that uh, the first obtuse marginal is totally occluded. Mm -hmm. And once you push your wire through there, you have a flow in the first obtuse marginal. On top of that, you have you know, high-grade stenosis in both the proximal LED as well as your uh, circumflex artery. Okay, so you have a multivessel disease, but I think in the setting of a multivessel disease, this acute marginal occlusion is the STEMI culprit okay. and has taken, has caused this cardiogenic shock situation. Um, I think um, there is also a disease in the right coronary artery. Um, I would be more inclined towards um, sending this patient for consideration for bypass surgery after I have established a flow through the obtuse marginal. Uh, because if you see the risk of re stenosis with the two layers of stents in the uh, left main LED, and uh, even though you've done a T stent, there is a high risk of re stenosis, at least I would say 
close to 20%. And this man could be again in the same situation uh, down the road. So I would actually consider um, talking to a heart surgeon about this. this. This is my, I will ask other panelists what they think. The other part is you didn't talk about was it, what was his ejection fraction. If his ejection fraction was low in the setting, then it again makes that point of doing a you know, consideration of bypass surgery a more relevant um, scenario. I will open this to the other panelists for comments. Right. I agree completely with you that I think that the culprit vessel is the first marginal branch. The distal left main doesn't look that bad, but it's a, it's a high-grade restenosis uh, in the proximal LAD stent. And, and there's then likely also a significant stenosis at the proximal circumflex in this co-dominant patient. So, uh, you know, uh, I would consider exactly like you uh, opening up the first marginal branch, establishing flow in, in that vessel, and then possibly just leaving it after a POBA if I have good enough result, and then bringing up the patient for, for a heart team discussion uh, with the surgeons. So I, I agree with that because uh, proximal LED uh, instant restenosis of the stent and then osteal circ is involved, then OM is the culprit. I think one important thing um, to remember that whenever there is a shock, uh, we always think it's either from the left main or like very uh, proximal LED or so we, but if the patient has additional disease, even the distal OM lesion uh, STEMI can cause the shock. So that is just an additional thing that just happened on the top of what he had. So he already has disease and then on the top of that OM STEMI and that could have threw him in the shock. One thing, looking at the wall motion itself from the angiogram, we know the ejection fraction is probably 25, 30%. So uh, I agree with the panelists that restoring the flow in the OM and then um, then sending the patient uh, for the cabbage evaluation at least. And based on that, because what, what are the chances the second time he won't get the ISR and then we are putting the two layers of a stent uh, compromising the lumen or so. Uh, Dr. Ayman, um, I had yes. a couple of um, uh, questions and comments to make. First of all, before we get to the more serious stuff, let's talk about what is actually important. Go to your very last slide. Did you find a result? No, 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 no. Last slide where, where uh, you had the picture. Ah, uh, the picture. <laughs> beautiful. Where is this? This is a beautiful picture. Where is this taken? Tell us this a little bit more about this. <laughs> this is uh, Sus. This is the city where I live and where I, where I work. <laughs> oh, wow. Yes. Uh, now, how, many, uh, how big is the city? How many million? What, what is this? Thing? It's like... Um, uh, it's in Asia, we don't have millions in our cities. We have in Sus, uh, I think, near, near one million. Uh, one million. One or, million. A uh, little bit less. I think. Okay. What is the walled uh, structure in the front of the image that we're looking at on the foreground? On the foreground, this is the, the mosque in the, the, uh, the Medina, the ancient Medina. Ancient Medina. Uh, the, the city, the, the ancient city, yes. So this is uh, a city from the Middle Age. Wow. Beautiful. Beautiful. So, so Gautam, he, don't you want to live in there? You're, you're all welcome to come and visit. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I think that will be an important thing once COVID is done, you know. Uh, yes. I had uh, the question I had, so you have around a million, uh, where is the nearest bypass program? Because that is another important issue. You may not have it in your same city. That's uh, that's what I was trying to find out. Yes, we are uh, we are working in, uh, in a facility with, uh, with really scarce resources. So uh, we don't... Uh, and uh, in the hospital where I work, we don't have access to to uh, cardiac surgery on site. Okay. We have to uh, transfer uh, uh, the patient to another uh, to another uh, hospital, and it is uh, really hard to do that, uh, especially in the setting of the cardiogenic shock. 
and uh, ejection fraction was uh, was low. I'm sorry, I didn't uh, I didn't mention it, but uh, ejection fraction a uh, nickel cardiogram was done before uh, the, the cat lab, and the uh, ejection fraction was 35 percent with uh, a large uh, hypokinesia in the anterior wall. So uh, usually surgeons are uh, usually are want us to stabilize the patient first before mm. they, they don't they don't want to take uh, patients in acute uh, cardiogenic shock because the outcomes are really uh, not uh, good. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, even if you pull the trigger and say I want to put a balloon pump in and transfer this patient for cabbage. Mm -hmm. uh, assuming that the surgeon says, yes, we'll take him. What is the time delay you think there is going to be? Uh, usually, the cardiogenic shock, they don't take him. Uh, the, the they won't same. even touch. I don't remember uh, that uh, this scenario happened in, in my center. I uh, first, first uh, as I said, we work with the scarce resources, and uh, we still don't have access to any type of mechanical support. So. Uh, don't we don't have no uh, the balloon so, pump? So there and is no balloon pump, no uh, uh, impeller, no, no mechanical. It was really a life-saving procedure. So <laughs> I understand. I understand. So yeah, then that changes the flavor of this of this whole uh, case presentation, uh, because uh, you know these are desperate times. Now I want to throw this back to our panelists, and say, hey. Uh, you know, what do you guys think now, given uh, the information that you have now been presented about the scenario of practice? I think it doesn't change anything for me because uh, we have the culprit shock trial. Uh, we used to think we had to revascularize everything uh, in shock and, and there may be such cases. But in general, I think that the main thing is to treat the culprit vessel, stabilize the patient. Uh, after that, I mean, I think the balloon pump has a limited use, uh, which is more common than, of course, the impella. Uh, stabilize the patient and then redo the, the if, you know, regardless if it's surgery uh, or PCI, stabilize the patient. You can either transfer them if that's deemed uh, what to do. But I think it's also better to do a complex case like this, not under the cardiogenic shock conditions, uh, where you can plan your strategy if you decide to do PCI. I think, you know, um, uh, given that the situation um, at this point of time, uh, I will do what, uh, what it was, how it was done, because, uh, you know, you can transfer the patient far away, wherever you want, and um, you, you save yourself, okay, because you don't want to get into the trouble what you did, uh, patient with a low ejection fraction, you don't have any backup, uh, so, uh, like you know it must be very stressful uh, and then you are doing a very high risk PCI so and also the social situation of the patient you never know that whether patient can go there how much is the cost and everything so I think that yes it will change the way um, I could have done pretty much the same way you have done and I really uh, want to applaud you because this was a very high risk patient and you took chance and you saved the patient. So that's the first goal. And um, no matter how much we talk, but sending the patient out of the city when you can do something and with the complexity and everything, then um, that's what we do. And uh, I think I would have done the same way what you have done. Dr. Sajdev. I think uh, uh, both strategies are fine. I think uh, in a given scenario, what we are hearing um, that uh, the uh, closest uh, center, uh, which is far away for bypass surgery and they're not willing to actually uh, entertain uh, a complex uh, uh, multivessel disease patient in uh, cardiogenic shock, or even, I guess, with a low ejection fraction, even if this patient recovers and we do culprit uh, vessel, uh, just uh, POBA. Um, I guess every country, every city has its own challenges. Um, and I think given that scenario, 
you know, we're sitting in the US and uh, in Europe, the, the way medicine is practiced is really different. Uh, very, um, um, you know, th this is academic uh, practice here. We go based on um, what is the science behind this. But I think uh, countries like uh, Tunisia, where resources are limited, um, this may be very challenging. And uh, I think given that scenario, what you have accomplished and the end result is fantastic, which is, which is good for the patient and good for you. And uh, that demonstrates uh, a good skill from your end uh, to achieve such a, a complex uh, PCI in with the limited resources. Um, I think uh, without uh, Impala support, without uh, the loan pump, I, I think um, uh, th this is a fantastic result um, given this scenario. Congratulations, uh, Dr. Ayman, uh, great case. Thank you for sharing. Uh, very difficult scenario, you know, when uh, I think, uh, you know, it's, 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 uh, you must have really felt like you were on the front line with this one. It's a, it's a tough case. Congratulations again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We will move on to our next speaker. And uh, I think we are uh, finally coming back to the year. Uh, so we will have uh, Dr. Saurabh Kutari tell us about table of truth uh, using invasive hemodynamics to diagnose constrictive pericarditis when other modalities fail. And uh, he's also going to be telling us on what this other modalities that fail are as well. Uh, excellent. Uh, Dr. Kutari, it's your stage. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kumar, for giving me the opportunity to present. Uh, my name is Sorb Katari. I'm a first year cardiology fellow uh, in Park Ridge, Illinois at Advocate Lutheran. So today I will be talking about uh, using invasive hemodynamics um, to diagnose constrictive pericarditis when some of the other imaging modalities that we have at our disposable fail. Uh, I have no disclosures uh, to um, discuss. So our case starts with a 80-year-old male, history of coronary artery disease, proxismal atrial fibrillation, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, six sinus syndrome. He was status post dual chamber pacemaker, uh, who initially presented to us with shortness of breath in 2018. He mostly complained of dyspnea with exertion and worsening exercise fatigue. He did have an episode of proxismal nocturnal dyspnea, which initially prompted him to seek medical evaluation. Initial echocardiogram uh, that was done in the office showed a severely reduced ejection fraction of 25%. He underwent coronary angiogram at that time in 2018, which showed moderate diffuse atherosclerosis of the left and right coronary systems without any critical lesions. He also underwent cardiac MRI, which showed an EF of 40% and a dense inferior wall scar consistent with a previous RCA infarct. He was placed on GDMT and his uh, EF actually improved to 50%. The patient uh, presented again to us, however, in June of 2020, with a worsening complaints of dyspnea on exertion. This was his MRI uh, that was done in 2018. Uh, the MRI itself showed no evidence of uh, pericardial uh, effusion or thickening. Additionally, there was no septal bounce, which uh, any suggestive of pericardial uh, restricted volume. Again, uh, demonstrated the inferior wall uh, subendocardial fibrosis in the bas basal and mid inferior walls which was just reflective of his previous uh, RCA infarct, um, but otherwise really no reason to dis uh, describe why the patient was so dyspneic or his, um, his, his really symptom symptomology. At that time in uh, uh, 2020, we decided to do an echocardiogram to look for further causes of uh, his complaints um, with an idea of, uh, does he have any sort of restrictive or constrictive physiology? This was a picture of his IVC. His IVC was dilated, uh, plethoric at 2.26 centimeters, but with respiration, uh, it was collapsible, um, really not showing much of a, uh, a volume overload state. Tissue Doppler uh, demonstrated uh, a lateral uh, E prime velocity of uh, 11 centimeters per second, 
Uh, and then his medial yeah, E-prime velocity was 9.5 centimeters per second, really not showing any evidence of the mitral annulus reversus um, that we would kind of expect the, when we look for uh, restriction or constriction. Again, M mode, uh, there was really absence of the ventricular septal shift uh, with inspiration and expiration. Um, another thing that we look for is the abnormal beat to beat shuddering that you would expect uh, when looking for any sort of restrictive disease. This again was absent in our case. We did an M mode of uh, through the short axis as well uh, and kind of inconclusive uh, when we were looking through these images. Uh, this was the mitral inflow pattern with, uh, with respiration. And again, uh, there was minimal variation uh, in, the, in the velocities, uh, kind of leaving us uh, again uh, with multiple questions of what was truly happening to the patient. Hepatic vein, uh, although there is, was some diastolic flow uh, reversal, as you can see here in, in the diagram, uh, with uh, inspiration. Uh, the ratio, uh, however, was not really convincing of uh, any sort of constriction. We decided to repeat the uh, tissue Doppler after giving a, a volume challenge, some fluid. And again, the lateral and medial uh, velocities didn't change actually uh, that much. Uh, so this kind of left us scratching our heads thinking, uh, you know, what exactly are we uh, dealing with? Because there was no formal diagnosis uh, that could be attributed to the patients. Um, symptoms. So we decided to take him for uh, angiogram and uh, bilateral heart cath. This was done in September, so just a couple of months after he initially presented uh, in June. <clears throat> so this was uh, our RAO caudal view. You can see he has a, a tight left main uh, stenosis. Um, LAD was actually not too bad. Uh, he did have some disease in the, in the circ as well. And then he had some disease uh, in, the, in the RCA territory. These were a left and right heart cath. Um, with the uh, pressures uh, showing a good uh, example of ventricular uh, interdependence, uh, especially with respiration. Um, you know, as you can see, uh, the LV pressure uh, drops with the RV uh, pressure uh, increasing uh, as the respiratory cycle uh, goes through. And then this was also uh, our classic dip and plateau um, uh, features that we see with, uh, with constriction uh, equalization of our end diastolic uh, pressures. Uh, hemodynamics is LVEDP was uh, 17 with the RVEDP of 17 as well. This kind of confirming uh, our diagnosis of uh, constrictive pericarditis. He had an elevated RV systolic pressure uh, of 30 um, and a wedge that was uh, mildly elevated 21. His PA pressures were normal. Given the results of his uh, angiogram with uh, the findings of his left main as well as some diffuse disease, uh, ultimately we referred him for uh, a cabbage evaluation uh, with our CT surgery colleagues and uh, the patient ended up going uh, for bypass. Um, in the OR, uh, it was noted that the patient uh, had, uh, uh, he went for pericardial dissection uh, the pericardium was firmly adherent to the entire cardiac structure. Um, initially, the pathology uh, that was sent, it did show mesothelial line fibrous tissue and chronic inflammation uh, and fibrosis. Uh, and so after his pericardial stripping, the patient actually improved uh, quite significantly. We just saw him last month and his functional capacity uh, has improved uh, uh, greatly, um, you know, uh, showing that uh, he is... Um, kind of cured of, uh, of whatever was going on. So for me, this case really kind of represents a, a unique challenge. Um, we have all these imaging modalities uh, at our disposal and uh, we went through all of them, you know, from MRI to uh, CT scan to X-ray, echo, and uh, we weren't able to really uh, find any cause for uh, the patient's symptomology until we took him to our 
uh, cath lab, and uh, we were able to uh, to make the diagnosis ultimately. Uh, so that is my case. Thank you. So congratulations. Uh, this was a great case, and then of course a very good uh, elicitation of the hemodynamics. But uh, you know, I saw only one picture of cranial view for the left main. And there is no caudal view. So did you do any uh, any imaging or anything to confirm that this was a left main disease? First of all, uh, we we didn't do any uh, intravascular imaging. There were other views uh, that we took um, that did show it a little bit better. I just I forgot to include them in my presentation, unfortunately, because I was trying to shorten it. So that is the key aspect, because if you see even in the cranial view, I can see very good flow, like, you know, in the rest of the vessel. So mm -hmm. cranial view is definitely not a good view to assess the left main. It can be adjunctive to your rest of the views. That's not the view. Second is patient can have the constructive pericarditis and might not be symptomatic. Why we are undermining the effect of coronary artery disease in your own terms, the patient went for cabbage. So maybe the coronary artery disease resolution has caused a resolution of symptoms? That's a, a good point. I think that uh, uh, based on the, the description of how adherent the pericardium was and how constricted uh, the, the uh, pericardium was to the, the heart itself, uh, I think that you're right, it could be just the coronary artery disease, but I don't think uh, I don't know. Maybe we can't discredit how uh, how uh, constrictive pericarditis uh, could be playing a role. I don't know if we would have the answer uh, to that. You know, hemodynamically, uh, based on what we saw, uh, it makes sense uh, that uh, this does it's acting uh, like constrictive pericarditis based on our uh, hemodynamics. And even when we gave the fluid challenge, um, all of those things. But uh, you're right. That's a, a very good point. So, uh, Saurabh. Um, Gotham is trained at Mayo Clinic, mm -hmm. so he is going to give you some points about oh, perfect. pericarditis. Okay, uh, but I want to point out a few things here. Um, the uh, see the thickness of the pericardium, though on a MRI was not picked up as thick. Uh, the other way to pick up is to do a CT scan and see what, what is the thickness of the pericardium. Mm -hmm. Then when the uh, pericardium was removed, you can see what was the thickness of the pericardium. You know, this is going to be a fibrous tissue. Uh, uh, I think uh, you really have to sort of put those together that why the pericardium is not thick yet it's causing a constrictive physiology there. Mm -hmm. Now the constrictive physiology, your your diagnosis is based on interdependence uh, on your LV RV pressures. Right. And I want to point out the tracings you actually have shared with us. There is a lot of ectopy. Okay. There is, yeah. Now um, there is a, going to be a beat to beat variation. Um, uh, if you have a nice clear tracing where you have a respirometer along with this, and then you are able to show that there is a uh, difference in the area, okay? Mm -hmm. So the area which is from the RV to the LV has changed in inspiration to expiration. That will be really your true um, sort of interdependence. Sure. You, you see that there is so much of act be there. Right. I don't know whether I will. I will just go with that. Okay. Well, this is uh, uh, interdependence, and this is constrictive pericarditis based on this uh, um, this particular tracing. Great point. Great point. So I have one question for you. It was great presentation, and um, this is just hypothetically speaking, uh, if if the coronary angiogram would have been normal, mm -hmm. what would have been your next step? Yeah, so, you know, that's a, a, a great point. Um, if the, we had tried, he was on uh, medical management, you know, diuretics, um, uh, GDMT, yet symptomology, like he was just doing worse and worse. Uh, his exercise capacity was, was worsening, uh, his dyspnea on exertion, orthopnea. So I'm not sure, you know, we got lucky because he had 
triple vessel disease or with left main. So he went for uh, uh, cabbage and they were able to see, visualize the pericardium. But none of our imaging modalities uh, at that time had really shown uh, anything kind of involving the pericardium. One thing we might've considered at that time was maybe to repeat a, a cardiac MRI to further look at the pericardium. You know, his last cardiac MRI was in 2018. So dating two years prior to it. Uh, he did have a CT scan uh, in the past, uh, even in the same year, that really no, didn't show any involvement of, of pericardium. Um, he did have some lung uh, calcification. I think it was all just work exposure from whatever he did in the past. But uh, it, it is a diagnostic dilemma. Uh, uh, you know, what would be your, your next step since you're trying medical therapy and it clearly seems like nothing is, is truly working at that point. So why don't you think this is all because of CAD? And it has nothing to do with pericardium altogether, the shortness of breath and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And if he had a CT scan, what was the calcium score there? And was there any calcium in the coronary arteries at that point? It wasn't a, there was not gated for, we didn't get a calcium score on, uh, on him. It was just a lung CT because of his shortness of breath. Uh, I don't know what the, the calcium score uh, was, to be honest, but that's a, an excellent point uh, as well. Okay, um, Saurabh, so go back and play the angiogram for me. I'm uh, trying to figure through this case a little. Go ahead and play that. Okay, uh, go back to the RCA one more time. Okay, I want to point out something in this angiogram, okay? Sure. Uh, the mid-RCA mm -hmm. is the fastest moving segment in the entire heart, which corresponds to your RVE prime velocity uh, of the right annulus on your echocardiogram. Mm -hmm. And if you look, this right ventricle is not moving. There's right. not much movement in this right ventricle at all. Look at that, the annulus is not moving a whole lot at all. So that's right. the first point. Now go to your next image, show me the left. Go ahead, play that. Okay, so I can't assess coronary motion here very well. The right. LAD, LAD looks uh, strange here. Is it? Yeah, it looks strange. I don't see the LAD. Exactly. It's a total. It's a CT of the LED. Exactly. Or? It looks like it looks like it's total, it's, it's, and that's, yeah. that's exactly why I can't assess its motion because I can't really see it well enough to talk about the motion of the LED. It looks like it is total. Do you no, have, don't, don't have any other views of the LED, do you? There, there was one more caudal view. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this one. Yeah, let's play this. Yeah. I wonder whether that is a diagonal, that's, and the LED is actually total. Yes, and there's a, a collateral CTRG. somewhere, somewhere yeah. also. Yeah, there's a collateral to the PDA or PLV of some sort. And PL, PL is occluded in the uh, the previous angiogram yeah. on the RCA. The PL is, and that's a, those are the collaterals to the PL. The circ has a high grade stenosis. I see the left main is totally fine. Uh, after the septal, um, yeah, I think that that's a diag. There is no LED there after the septal that's LED what I is occluded. Yeah, that's right. I'm missing this left main stenosis. That's that's what I was trying to allude to here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and and then you can go to the right and maybe you will see there is a LED which lights up from the right coronary artery. Um, oh, yeah. I don't see it, Dr. Sachdev. Uh, it's kind of okay. hard to see. Yeah, it, it, it is further out. The apex yeah. is out there. They have not panned that far. Okay, uh, keep going. Next, uh, go go forward. Uh, I'm 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 not really. Uh, show me that cranial view that you had where you thought that there was that left main. Sure. Yeah, go ahead and play that. Uh, it's hard. Yeah, maybe there is an osteal left main there. It could, it could be an osteal. Yeah, it could be an osteal left main. Yeah. But it could be spasm too, Gotham, because the way it, it, it could absolutely this point be is a spasm. Jackie, which is yeah. Yeah. So the cabbage is justified. That's not a problem. No, no, that's fine. Uh, keep, keep, keep going to the next image. Uh, yeah, keep, keep going. I want to see your hemodynamic tracings. Oh, sorry, sorry. 
Okay. So I agree with Dr. Sachdev here mm -hmm. that the hemodynamic tracings that you are showing me in this image are based on this particular tracing. I cannot conclude that this patient has constrictive pericarditis. Okay. Okay. Uh, you need to have no ectopy and you need to have a relatively flat uh, tracing. The other problem with this tracing is that your LVEDP and your RVEDP are probably around 10 to 15 millimeters mercury most of the time. There are some areas that are probably 15, but really, you know, it's not really much more than that. And on this beat in the middle, I wouldn't really say that they're equalized either. Mm -hmm. so, you know, we need, we need some better tracings than this to work with. And uh, sometimes, and again, this, there's a fair amount of variation in the RR interval here as well, but this is slightly better. But again, I'm not able to ask uh, to, uh, to appreciate the respiratory variation in this tracing. Uh, but if you look at the middle two where you would assume that inspiration is occurring, mm -hmm. uh, it looks like it's concordant. I don't see overt discordance in these two tracings, but I don't see the top of the LV tracing right, right, right. to be able to com comment on that. So again, that's, you know, that's kind of problematic with those tracings. You know, I'm not, well, you can't say with that PVC there that messes you up. You can't say that, oh, there's discordance in the one, two, three, four, five, six, five, six heartbeat. You can't say that that's diagnostic for discordance. Okay. Because of that PVC, it actually messes it up. Okay. Yeah. So based on this, this is not really convincing for uh, constructive pericarditis. Now I recognize that there may be other tracings that helped you make the diagnosis. Sure, sure. The one point that I want to make here that is important mm -hmm. is that in some of these cases, it is important to do a fluid challenge. Yes, that yes. That can actually help you with your diagnosis as well, especially when the right atrial pressure is low mm -hmm. uh, and the patient is known to be on diuretics. Right, That's right. An important piece that gets into it. Uh, now, this patient was going for cabbage anyway, so you got lucky. Yeah. But uh, if you just had this, then uh, I would tough call to, make, yeah. to send this guy to surgery with just based on this. Right, right. Yeah. But, you know, I recognize the fact that constrictive pericarditis is one of the great mimickers in medicine. Yeah. And I think that's the what I learned the most from this case is, you know, it's a tough diagnosis to make when kind of everything is... Uh, uh, nebulous to say the least, you know, our MRI, echo, CT, uh, invasive hemodynamics, you're right, there's a lot of variation, uh, but it gave us a clue and, and I completely agree we got lucky with the idea of having to send them to cabbage. Hindsight is always 2020, and how we approach this case, uh, I think it makes us think about the future when we see kind of these diagnostic dilemmas and what we would use uh, differently. One being the uh, the fluid challenge while they're on the table uh, to really get a true assessment of hemodynamics is something that I think we would include in our, our arsenal as well. Okay, this is good. Um, all right, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kotari. And if you can unshare your sure. screen, we will move our next speaker, who is going to be Dr. Uruj Fatima from uh, uh, MUSC. We're coming down south, uh, not far away from where we are in Atlanta. And she is going to be telling us about successful proximal CTO intervention of the LAD using sequential atherectomy. And uh, I'm particularly interested in this because I'm wondering what sequential atherectomy is. So, uh, uh, Dr. Fatima, please. Uh, Gautam, before we go on to the next one, there is a question. Uh, could you explain that? Uh, because this is put on um, the question answer chat there. Um, I, can I, you will please? Type it, I will type it on the chat. Okay, wonderful. Thank yeah. you. Uh, Dr. Fatima, continue, please. Good morning. Um, thank you for giving me this opportunity to uh, present this case at this forum. So um, this is uh, one of the cases where we intervened um, on a CTO of LED using um, atherectomy, sequential atherectomy of diagonal and the main LED branch um, using over the wire technique. 
So we know that um, CTOs are one of the most challenging coronary interventions, and there's always very increased risk of um, any kind of major complications, and success rates are also uh, pretty low. Um, with the use of new tools that we have now, as in atherectomy and laser devices, and other imaging modalities such as IVIS and OCT, success rate has been considerably increased with lesser degrees of complication during these complex interventions. So this particular case, a patient presented with proximal LED CTO, and we decided to go with a single radial axis using stage atherectomy and modified stingray technique to intervene on that uh, segment of uh, CTO. So a little bit about his uh, clinical presentation and history. So this was 61 years old man um, with um, uh, quite a bit of comorbidities. He had hypertension, hyperlipidemia, he was diabetic and uh, kept on coming back with um, episodes of uh, chest pain that was ongoing, presented with unstable angina. Nuclear stress test was done and uh, that was consistent with defect in septal and anterior septal and apical myocardium uh, involving LED therapy. Angiogram revealed proximally occluded segment of LED, CTO with a very large diagonal branch at the uh, right where the CTO started. And um, it was reconstituting distally and the LED was getting collateral flow from circumflex. Based on his symptoms and nuclear stress test and the coronary angiogram, decision was made to um, intervene on LED CTO. So, um, and I will play the video in the next shot. So there, there was, we could see a very brief flow going all the way down to the distal apical LED and um, uh, diagonal bifurcation right there. Sorry, I think I'm having some trouble with the video. I suppose we'll have to imagine what the CTO looks like. <laughs> uh, just go on to the next slide. I, I think we get the general idea. Yeah, we get the idea. Keep going. So, um, the LED, in terms of the intervention, LED intervention was attempted. However, we couldn't cross the lesion with the bifurcation at, at where the diagonal branch was taking off. Um, a part of the reason was severe calcification at that junction of LED and diagonal bifurcation, and also the acute angle takeoff um, of the side branch. So BMW wire using over-the-wire balloon um, could only be advanced every time we tried to wire LED, it got deflected into the diagonal branch. So we decided to do rotational atherectomy from the LED into diagonal in an attempt to create a channel so that that might help us to rewire LED more easily on subsequent intervention to be planned. So we went ahead and um, did rotational atherectomy from the LED into the channel, into the diagonal branch, over that, and the plan was to bring the patient back to see that if he would have a little more flow through that channel and we would have some plaque modification and then we could wire LED subsequently. So unfortunately that I'll try with the video, but I, it's not playing here. This was the result post um, rotational atherectomy from LED into the diagonal branch and POVA of that. Now we could see flow going down all the way to the distal LED, but still the segment of um, the proximal LED CTO segment was there. So. We had the patient come back in two weeks for an intervention on the CTO. So now as a part of this stage intervention, we reattempted to wire the LED with over the wire balloon. We used a 208 millimeter balloon over Miracle Bross wire. But again, we had same trouble. 
every time we tried to like wire the lesion, we couldn't go across in spite of doing one round of rotational thoracotomy. Um, then uh, it was decided that uh, now what? So we uh, looked at the angiogram and went ahead with modified sting stingray technique to cross the CTO of the LED. So BMW wire was advanced in the diagonal branch, which we could very easily wire. And over the wire balloon using miracle gross wire was directed into the plaque. And we tried to deflect that away from the diagonal branch into the main vessel. Um, with this technique, we were able to cross using miracle gross um, into LED, into the all the way to the apical distal portion of the vessel. Um, following that, we exchanged the wire for rotor floppy wire and did perform rotation at the rectum of the LED vessel. We pre-dilated the vessel with 3020 balloon and stented that with 32528 stent and then post-dilated that with the um, NC balloon. We had pretty good flow all throughout post-intervention into the diagonal branch without any compromise of the side branch or perforation or dissection. So uh, once done with the procedure, we felt that our results in terms of the flow in the major vessel and the side branch was good. So um, this case, uh, what we felt was uh, kind of interesting about this was that it highlights the modified CTO technique using sequential etherectomy or bifurcation lesion. It was a tough uh, calcified lesion with a difficult angle of wiring for the side branch. So in instead of going with two catheter approach or um, going with the um, other devices, we just used a single radial access to perform the entire procedure in two stage, uh, in two different stages with a good result. Um, another thing was that um, this, uh, we don't have much uh, data that I'm aware of, of the use of etherectomy in CTO interventions as a routine use. So, um, Atherectomy is kind of performed in 3% of CTO PCIs. And um, eventually, not only related to atherectomy, but overall as a part of a complex procedure, these procedures can be associated with risk of dissection, vessel injury, tamponade. So we felt that using over the wire balloon technique, um, using the wire and atherectomy with that, we could uh, very effectively perform this procedure with quick recovery time and energy discharge because of radial access. Thank you. Very good presentation. Yeah. I will pass on to my uh, panelists for comments, yeah. Dr. Sachdev. All right. Um, so first of all, uh, uh, you know, a, a great case. Um, I'm sorry that the videos did not play. Uh, that would have given us a little more insight into uh, the case. Uh, what I could sort of uh, understand from the images, if you please go to your first image of the LED. Uh, sure. Just the still image since the videos are not playing. Uh, there may be a little uh, micro channel which actually goes there um, and you may be traveling with a BMW wire uh, in that micro channel, and then that's why you're able to go into the dyad. Um, now, uh, you know, CTO operators, they usually have, uh, you know, different tools uh, to redirect that wire, or, you know, the various tools they can use is they can after pre dilatation into that channel, they can come back with another wire, which is a parallel wire technique, or you can take uh, um, a second wire and you can uh, put a little more bend on it and try to poke through there. Um, I think um, rotor blading this and getting a little more uh, space in there is, a, is fine. But, uh, um, I think uh, the channel was there, it was just a direction of the uh, 
wire to go into the LED. You could have used a, a, a field XT wire to actually go in there. You could have used a, a pilot series wire. Um, you know, those are polymer jacketed wires which could have gone into the uh, LED. Um, uh, the, the image which you showed next um, in that second attempt, looks like you, you guys came back after you left the, uh, after balloon angioplasty. To me that this uh, proximal LED seems to be dissected. And to me, the proximal portion of the left main, there either is, is not filled with contrast or there is a dissection there. Um, we, it's hard to say. We did uh, or it may more pictures for that because we did have that concern. And it looked more like that in, in some of the other pictures that there wasn't really a dissection, it was more like lack of filling of the vessel. But we had not IVIST uh, uh, the left main because nothing would even pass through the proximal LED. Everything was deflected right into the diagonal vessel. So there very well could be a small dissection in the proximal vessel. So, so this, sorry for that. Go ahead, go ahead, Kusa. So this is a good case, you know, and then I understand that sequential atherectomy, you did it uh, for the purpose of opening the channel, but this can turn into catastrophe because have you dissected, the, if you dissected the left main or proximal LED without having access to distal LED, so what's your plan? You are going to, then you will have to stent it through that small diagonal. Of course, later on, you can salvage the case for like, you know, but that might not work in the coronaries. We do that a lot in the peripheral, but there is not that much problem because, you know, some non-flow dissection, I can always leave it in the SFA and leave it. But in the coronaries, you like, you can leave the, the non-flow limiting dissection, in the left main or something, but that's, you, you, you will lose your sleep. Um, very well taken, that's true. Um, we, before we uh, closed, uh, like we staged this procedure and we got our like final shots, we were pretty confident it was not extending uh, all the way back into the left main. But but I, I, I kind of, I totally agree with you, that's true. Because if it was to, if it was to extend all the way back or that could have been a major problem and a major bailout that would have been needed right there. So, Dr. Fatima, I uh, there's a, there's a couple of stuff that uh, I'm I'm oh, going to go based on potential evidence. Given the fact that this is a calcified lesion with extreme calcification, and the fact that uh, Dr. Fernandez uh, was involved with you as the attending, I am assuming that the, that the VA in charge. Yes, this was at, uh, absolutely, this was done at uh, Ralph A. E. Johnson VA Medical Center. Okay, all right. Uh, so th th this is great because uh, as Dr. Sachdev and myself uh, uh, are both painfully aware, the average VA CTO is a little different from the conventional CTO that we see in the regular hospitals. Uh, because the measure of calcification that we get, it's a totally different order of magnitude that we're dealing with. Uh, and, and I think we can safely say that. Uh, and that's why, you know, in a lot of these progress CTO registries and other registries, like the slide you pointed out, you know, the incidence of atherectomy is uh, 3%, you said? Yes. Uh, yeah, and the reason is because these kind of severe falsified CTOs are not included or represented in the bulk of those populations. So, you know, it is fair to say that the techniques required to deal with these may be a little different in experienced hands like such as Dr. Fernandez, for example, uh, or myself and Dr. Sachdev, uh, who, uh, you know, who deal with a slightly different breed of CTOs than the average non-calcified CTOs, which may require a different technique. So I think that's the, the, that's the first point. And so I can appreciate the need for uh, a slightly modified that Dr. Fernandez chose to take. Second point, uh, you have to make sure that your videos work for these presentations. It is a very smart idea to have uh, 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 JPEG images, but it is much better to show us the videos because we may be making up stuff about left main dissection when it's just you know the flow streaming that we're not seeing. Sure. I, I think yeah. we 
better uh, appreciation uh, for these on videos. Uh, I will pass on to Goran for his comments as well. Thank you, Gautam. Uh, th congratulations on a successful case. Uh, Thank you. And, uh, but uh, just a couple of questions for you. First of all, um, why didn't you uh, use like a field or a hydrophilic wire uh, uh, like a microcatheter, you know, a BMW wire in a, in a highly calcified lesion? It, you're going to get too much friction uh, and you're not quite able to see exactly what a tip is with an over the wire balloon. And second question is in this image of, uh, I think it's number nine that you're showing right now. Uh, it looks, I assume that you had the wire down in that diagonal uh, before you stopped the case and you have like a really great opportunity to use a dual lumen catheter to bring that out here and, you know, fairly atraumatically wire the LAD. So, um, well, what he's talking about is a Suzuki, which is a dual lumen catheter, or you can even take a twin pass. Um, yeah, quick cross also. Um, I think briefly I, I lost the connection here. Um, I'm sorry, could you please briefly uh, repeat the question? So first question, why not, uh, when, you, when you started the procedure here, why didn't you use a hydrophilic uh, wire like Fielder XT and a microcatheter instead of using you know, the, this BMW wire, which is, you know, causes a lot of friction and uh, using an over-the-wire balloon, you don't see quite the tip where you are uh, like you do with a microcatheter. That was the first question. So, second question. Like second, okay, go ahead and answer. Sorry. So for this one, this was more like, um, I would say attending preference. Okay. Um, we like, um, uh, we just, uh, we, at our art center, when we are doing CTOs, we do use uh, different wires, microcatheter. Um, and uh, this was just more, um, there was no specific reason as to why we did not attempt that, uh, that could have been one of the, uh, that's how the other hydrophilic wires, we routinely use them for our CTO interventions at our main, main site. Um, it was more that we just uh, were trying to be a little innovative and think uh, out of the box and see that if uh, not using any of those and just using regular BMW wire that, um, uh, somebody who is like as experienced as Dr. Fernandez uh, has so much experience with, could we just use the basic tools and navigate through a difficult case using them rather than because um, hydrophilic wires and microcatheter, absolutely. Uh, I mean, they are the to-go ones for CTOs. And in our majority of the CTO interventions that we do, we do use all of them. So this was just... Um, in order to create a little bit of innovation to see that if we could sail through using regular devices. Okay. The second question is in this image that you have right now, uh, you know, assume that you at one point had the wire in the uh, diagonal, uh, it looks like you have a great opportunity to use dual lumen catheter, like you know, the Suzuki or Twin Pass or something like that. And you could fairly, you know, bring it up to the, the ostium of the the diagonal or a little bit into diagonal and you could have a great chance to very atraumatically wire the LAD uh, there. And um, this, uh, your yes, that, that uh, we have, uh, we have um, adopted that technique in our other C2 interventions for this specifically uh, BMW and other, even Fielder XT would not uh, go even on pulling back right at the ostium and trying to redirect into the main LED vessel would not work. But I agree that if we would have tried another wires and we would have like tried to deflect it right where the bifurcation is into the main vessel, probably we could have been successful even after first pass to wire through the main vessel all the way to city. Yeah, congratulations on great case. Okay, if there are no further comments, uh, I will uh, go ahead and uh, it gives me great pleasure now to introduce our next speaker.
who is uh, Muhammad Al Madani, and uh, he is uh, actually coming to us from Einstein Medical Center in Philadelphia, and he's going to be telling us about breakthrough COVID-19 uh, infection in a fully vaccinated patient who presents with heart block in the setting of STEMI with LAD and RCA thrombosis. And uh, this, I thought, was a very nice uh, topical uh, scenario. Uh, please. Um, it's good morning slash afternoon slash evening, depending on your time zone. Uh, your desktop all, looks like mine. What's that? Your desktop looks like mine. Yeah. Oh, no, this that, is not your No, let, yeah, let me that's see. Uh, OK. So, if Fatima, Fatima, you can my... share your desktop yeah. so that uh, there you go. OK. Perfect. There you go. Excellent. First of all, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to present uh, uh, this case at this conference. I'm very appreciative for that. Uh, we are presenting a case of a, I'm presenting a case of a breakthrough COVID-19 infection in a fully vaccinated patient that presented with uh, hard block in terms of the STEMI. Um, so just uh, there's no financial disclosures. And um, as a background, so this patient was a 60-year-old uh, African-American patient with no previous medical history, not taking any medications, uh, who already received two doses of the mRNA-based COVID vaccine uh, 34 days before presentation. Uh, that was the second dose. Uh, he was brought by EMS. He was outside his house, and he collapsed. Uh, witnesses called EMS. Uh, upon arrival, uh, his EKG showed by EMS showed inferior ST elevation, uh, but in route the patient also developed a complete heart block with slow ventricular escape. So he was ultimately transcutaneously paced by EMS. This is the EMS EKG we received actually uh, before the patient arrived at the emergency room. This shows the complete heart block with AB dissociation and a very slow heart rate and on this EKG, uh, also obtained by EMS uh, on the way to the hospital, you can see uh, ST elevation in the 2, 3, and AVF with the reciprocal changes in V3 to V6, uh, suggestive of possible RCA related infarct as a culprit vessel. So in the emergency room, uh, the patient was conscious, but he was uh, extremely diaphoretic. Uh, his blood pressure was actually uh, stable at 120s over 60s, but that while he's being transcutaneously paced. He was covered in stool actually, and he was, uh, as I said, being transcutaneously paced. Uh, we wanted to try and see what his underlying rhythm is. Uh, so we turned off the pacer uh, for a few seconds, but the patient had completely no escape rhythm at that point, and he lost consciousness. So we turned the pacer back on. And uh, in the emergency room, he was given aspirin, 325 milligram, heparin, and uh, oral uh, atorvastatin, 80 milligram. And after he was cleaned, he was taken uh, to the cath lab. So uh, I'm going to show some pictures. But in the cath lab, what we did initially was we inserted transvenous spacer because uh, he was requiring high voltage on the transcutaneous, uh, and uh, it was not com uh, comfortable for the patient. And we did uh, perform coronary angiogram. We started the case thinking that the culprit is likely going to be in the right coronary distribution given the ST elevation, as well as the hard block, which is common in RCA infarct. Uh, but we, had to, you know, we did want to uh, engage and shoot the non, what we thought to be the non culprit vessel, at the same before that. So uh, this is a, a coronary angiogram of the left system, and uh, you can see there's a like a haziness in the very proximal LED portion, and we believe actually that uh, this is a, an early takeoff diag, and the actual LED itself it was completely occluded with two zero flow. And um, put this aside. Uh, and on this one, you can also see it again in this view, even though it's a little bit more overlap. But you can see after the takeoff of the diag, there's a sh the LED is completely shut down. And you can see actually some reconstitution of the very distal LED that comes late through that same diag. So the diag was given a diag to the distal LED collateral, filling back the LED retrogradely. So uh, interestingly, actually, the guider that you see in the left main is the GR4. So uh, we, our intention was to engage the RCA, but the guider, uh, you know, the fellow was trying to want to engage, and he popped into the left main. So we thought we'd take a picture with that, and that's what we saw. 
So we use the same guide duct to obtain images of the RCA, since we thought the LED is going to be the culprit. And again, here you can see there is a, there is a haziness or a filling defect in the very distal portion of the RCA. And if you look closely, you can see, uh, if you pause it here, you can see there's a, like a cutoff in the PD and PLA vessel. So there's maybe some part of the thrombus embolized distally and into the distal portion of the uh, PDA and even the PLA branches and other views. Uh, so at that point, and this is a still image of the RCA. So at that point, uh, you know, the thought process was we have a two thrombotic occlusions in two dis different anatomy in patient with no previous cardiac history. So we were suspecting an element of um, maybe um, like an embolic phenomena. We initially thought maybe it was um, like a patient had a fib and diagnosed and that he embolized to both coronaries uh, as one of the possibilities. Uh, so, you know, a part of this case was decision-making because at that point of time, uh, we were discussing whether this really is a plaque rupture or whether this is just an embolic phenomenon and, you know, the management will differ accordingly. So we decided to proceed with the LED intervention first because we felt there's a, the, you know, the one with no flow at that point and we thought that should be a fixed first. So we had the LED. We used just a regular wear, so wear course wire, in this case was a Xi'an blue. Uh, and w just with wiring, we were able to establish a TMT to flow in the LED. I'm going to show the uh, angiogram in a second. But after we wired and before we did proceed with any ballooning, we wanted to, uh, to just evaluate what kind of anatomy we're dealing with. So we decided to do an intravascular ultrasound. Uh, and this is on the left is the image of the ibis that uh, comes in the mid portion of the LED. You can see for the most part here, is, you can see the media with minimal lesion. There's some compression maybe at that point, but so far very minimal plaque. And as you go more toward the LED diabifurcation, you can see that there is maybe a calcified area here with some shadowing. Uh, but we also did appreciate, and after looking at multiple times, there's this area of kind of a, a multiple ecogenicity, like it's not a homogeneous area, it's uh, some like radiolucent and more uh, radio dense area. So we were suspecting an element of maybe there's a, a, a like a thrombus in that location. Uh, we actually looked at this IBIS multiple times uh, before we decided, uh, you know, the ultimate course of therapy. So um, after that, um, we decided that because uh, we could see the thrombus at this point to do a balloon angioplasty. And uh, what we did, we did balloon angioplasty uh, and after that, there was some distal embolization of the thrombus into the distal LED. So we used an aspiration thrombectomy device, and we were able to, uh, to actually treat few clots. Uh, we also started a patient on, in, on the cath table on uh, GLAD protein 2 B3A inhibitors. Uh, and he was also loaded with uh, ticagrelor. And uh, to help with the distal you know, flow, we did give adenosine, nicardipine, and uh, natroprosside to try to help the microcirculation, hoping to improve the TIMI flow in the distal LED. At that point of time, we still did not stent. We just did a balloon angioplasty alone. Uh, with that, his heart block actually, actually subsided, and he was back with, uh, at his intrinsic rate of 80. Uh, so we turned off the temporary pacemaker. And uh, before I show that what he did with the stent, I want to show that the angiogram we performed. This is just after the balloon, angi uh, the balloon angioplasty. So this is without any... Uh, PCI. As you can see, just by wiring and doing a uh, balloon angioplasty, we were able to achieve uh, a decent, you know, TIMI2 flow all the way to the this LED. It's not a brisk flow, but if you can see in this view, this is the area of concern we were concerned about, and the decision at that point whether to stent or not to stent. So, um, you know, initially we were going to just do ballooning, uh, but again, after looking at the IFS multiple times, we thought there is enough uh, disease in the proximal segment of the LED to warrant a stent. Uh, and in some views, it looks worse than other views. And so uh, this is after we performed the PCI, of the proximal LED. Uh, you can see that the, uh, you know, the, the flow in the LED is better. And we were able to treat the proximal lesion. Uh, so at that point, we decided to, we placed one stent. And on this angiogram, you can see the diag was uh, well preserved. Uh, and we confirmed that in the in the aleocal view, there is no, uh, in, you know, any encroachment on the RC in the diag ostium. So we decided to 
stay with the single spin technique and just uh, uh, you know the, the, we thought the diag was mainly occluded before by the clots that that we treated. Uh, at that point, we decided to reevaluate the in the same setting after we fixed the LED. We decided to reevaluate the right coronary artery, and uh, um, so we repeated an angiogram at the end of the case of the right coronary artery. As you can see, you still see some hint of the filling defect, but now if you look closely, you can see the PDA that was stumped is reconstituted fluid all the way to the to the posterior apex. So. Uh, with improvement in the lucency, at the same time, the patient ST elevation has resolved. So because of these findings and because of resolution of symptoms and resolution of hub block, we decided to uh, treat the RCA with, uh, you know, triple antiplatelet therapy. He was received aspirin and ticagrelor, and we continued patient on integralin for another uh, 18 hours post-procedure, uh, uh, you know, trying to treat this medically. And in this case, we didn't feel too bad about doing the triple therapy since it was a transradial axis. So the risk of bleeding is not, you know, is much less. Um, uh, this is the EKG of this patient uh, the next morning in that he was admitted to CCU with repeat EKG, almost completely normal. There might be like a hint of a C elevation here and maybe some small QA, but you don't see this in, two, in D2 or AVF. You didn't see any reciprocal changes and patient was completely asymptomatic at that point. Uh, uh, he had no further hard block. His atal cardiogram revealed uh, a rejection fraction of 55% with uh, no significant wall motion abnormality except for the very basal inferoceptal wall, which I thought was odd since kind of didn't you know, match the coronary angiogram, but that's the way it was read. Uh, but it was very subtle. Uh, and of course, patient was admitted to CCU, uh, as I said, his peak initial troponin in the emergency room was 0 0.15. They peaked at 38 before turning down. Uh, interestingly, we did, as it's uh, our protocol, we did, we did a COVID testing, all admission, inpatient admissions. And his COVID test actually came back positive, despite the fact that he received two doses of the mRNA vaccine, uh, which the, with the second dose being more than 34 before the presentation, which is theoretically should have achieved about 95% immunity according to the data we have. Uh, he, we did repeat the COVID test a second time to verify it was not a lab error, and it came back actually positive twice. His, uh, just I want to mention that because of the concern lately about some vaccine associated thrombosis that his platelet count and his coagulation profile were all normal. So there's no element to suggest TTP or anything like this. A uh, patient had no COVID symptoms except for the one episode of diarrhea, but that could have been triggered by the cardiac event and the RCA, you know, infarct um, and vagal tone. Uh, so the final message we believe, what we believe, uh, what we believe uh, unique about this case is that the patient developed a breakthrough COVID-19 infection that was associated in this case with life-threatening multi-vessel thrombus formation in the LED and the RCA, despite the fact he was fully vaccinated with absence of any significant pre-existing cardiac uh, history plaque or burden and with absence of any other COVID symptoms. And while breakthrough COVID-19 infection can still happen in fully vaccinated patients, to our knowledge, this is the first case in which a fully vaccinated patient developed a COVID-related coronary thrombotic complication and presented as a STEMI in two different coronary anatomy. And the third message I didn't include here is, you know, in these cases, sometime, uh, uh, you know, uh, maybe the treating these lesions with uh, intensive antiplatelet therapy could achieve revascularization if there is no clear uh, lesion identified. And uh, thank you so much for your attention and I appreciate the chat. So thank you very much for this really interesting uh, presentation of this, this uh, challenging case. Uh, I think there are lots of questions to be asked. Uh, my first question to you is, is uh, I'm wondering where do you think the assumed embol emboli uh, originated from? Do you have any speculation? Could it be so, a yeah, I mean, initially we, we were, I'm sorry, yeah, initially we were thinking maybe it was, like I said, like an, a patient with AFib or an LV apical thrombus, but once we found that the patient has COVID positive, we thought maybe the clot has actually originated in cyto. Uh, we could not identify any other sources of his, I mean, for a thrombi, I mean, his ejection pressure was normal, so the assumption was that these like the, the, the thrombus formation uh, due to COVID-19. 
I mean, there wasn't either some proximal ED disease, so that maybe that represented an area of uh, what, you know, the clot had formed, um, or maybe there was really just a flat fracture in the LED. And the second part is how long your patient is now on triple therapy. Uh, how long are you, how are you going to do with this anticoagulation and, and dual antithelial therapy? What's your plan for the future now? Okay, so we actually kept them, as I said, on the, on the integralin uh, just for 18 hours, after which we uh, kept them on, in dual antiphase therapy with aspirin and anticagrelor. And the plan, since it was an MI presentation, is to continue him on that for one year, uh, with, after one year consideration of either reducing the dose to 60 BID or just continue with the single agent. Yeah. Thank you, and it was a great case you presented. So uh, uh, my fellow panelists, uh, any comments? So the RCA was, on the, there was a distal thrombus in the RCA, and even though there was a flow to the PDA after the intervention, and that could be just because all the anticoagulations and everything we gave, how did you confirm that it was not a plaque rupture there and that caused it? The second thing is we all know the de novo plaque rupture, you don't need to have the thick plaque or thick calcium burden. Most of the time that happens with the thin cap plaque, which is not visualized. And especially in the, like, you know, this age population. So that could be all the plaque rupture and why it was not intervened. So the reason we didn't uh, at that point is, as I said, we felt his, uh, it looked, I mean, all the ST changes and the hard block improved once we opened up the LED. So we felt that the LED was probably what's causing his ST and, and current presentation. Uh, for the RCA, we did, I mean, you know, it the, the way it looked, it was kind of, you know, the, the plot rupture was a concern, but and the plan initially was to put him in triple therapy and maybe cap him two or three days later for the evaluation of the RCA to see if we need to stand it or not. Uh, you know, we know that a lot of time with, with even with the spontaneous lesion, some of these recanalize with the natural body system. And you know, honestly, you, your point is exactly correct. I mean, you can uh, you can you know do this case again and next time fix the RCA as well. But you know, I had a discussion with my fellow, and we actually had a discussion with one of our partners, and you know, we kind of took a while to decide, but we decided since he received a lot of contrast and his ST has subsided to continue to treat the RCA medically and then, you know, re, re, redo another angiogram uh, in, in, in a couple of days or if he has any other symptoms. So, you know, your point is exactly correct. I mean, you can make a case of that, uh, of, of fixing it. But the reason we didn't, we felt maybe there was an element of embolic phenomenon rather than just a, a true plaque rupture. And we wanted to give, and there was a TIMI-3 flow in the RCA that improved toward the end of the case. So that's why we didn't start to fix it. And the EKG you did later on uh, is uh, there is a three and AVF. There is a small Q wave. And yes. you, know, you can, so, so you know, later on, unless, uh, you know, there is no other way other than doing the angiogram. And of course, asymptomatic patient, we cannot justify doing angiogram in United States at least. And then, um, but we can say that probably it's not recanalized and going back. Probably he will do good because on triple therapy, but triple therapy has its own risk. No, correct. No, what I meant triple therapy, I meant aspirin and ticagrelor. The IV, uh, glycoprotein 2 b 3 a was just stopped, uh, you know, after the case. We felt there was so much thrombus that we, that's why we didn't wanted to do the, the glycoprotein 2 b 3 a inhibitors because of the high thrombus in two artery in your system. So, uh, but, you know, I, I, I see the point about, you know, they taken the RCA, and as I said, the decision was not. You know, part of, one of the reasons I wanted to show this case is that there's a lot of decision making through it. And at one point, we were considering not even to stand the LED because, on the you know, on the angiogram, you see significant improvement just after wiring, and and even the diag that in the initial angiogram showed to have an osseal lesion. Later on, with repeat angiogram, even after we stand the LED, looked at the diag was completely free of disease. You can see so, that, but you have to understand that the 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 where the origin of thrombus, you have to stent that because once that has caused thrombosis and probably COVID is one of the very thrombotic diseases and I've seen lots of thrombosis. But in this case, uh, unless you prove it that this was not plaque rupture related thrombosis and multiple plaque, plaque rupture that's causing the thrombosis, then you have to seal that. That's the yeah. idea of doing the angiogram. Correct, correct. And that's why when we did the IVAS, especially in this view, you can see this is after ballooning, you can still see the haziness in that area. So I, I believe there was a flat capture in that area of the LED and that we fixed. Um, 
so I mean, you know, as you said, it is similar to the previous case. A wire went to the diag first, and then we pulled back. You can see a second wire, and we had to pull the wire back into the LED to to canalize the LED. So you know, uh, you know, and we thought there was a plug up solid in the LED. You know, especially knowing the fact later looking at IVAS. But uh, the us, you know, at the time of the initial case, we were not sure if it's really a plug up or just uh, or just a thrombus because the IVAS was not. You know, looking at the IVAS, you can see the distal and proximal to the lesion. I mean, this is the mid LED. You almost see no plaque at all. So, but I agree with you. Sometimes these thin plaques are the ones that rupture and cause the thrombosis. Um, I uh, have. Uh, I had a couple questions. of questions. Go ahead, Doctor. Yes. Go ahead. yes. Um, so, um, you actually, if you go back, start from the EKG part of it. Yes. Um, I want to start. You know, majority. Of this, so this is a patient who presents with cardiac arrest. And you have an EKG which has the right bundle. And uh, in this particular one, this is, I don't see any, well, I see P waves. Uh, yeah. So this may be a total, uh, uh, yeah, this is a this is sort of a right bundle. So it, it has to be uh, below the junction for it to be a right bundle-ish. Um, not, not really, uh, difficult to say that this is all inferior STEMI. Now, I, I would say that I would say that patients who actually have a cardiac arrest, the likelihood of um, cardiac arrest is going to be a artery which is LED. Um, and if they have a complete heart block, the infarct is going to be a very big, um, and their outcome is really poor. Um, so if you can go on to the next uh, EKG where you have, so this is a escape rhythm um, and it's a complete heart block. You have, so go to the next ECG. I doubt that I will call this as the inferior STEMI. Um, you know, there is definitely a right bond of this is the escape rhythm complete heart block with the right bundle. So, um, um, and when you do the angiogram for a cardiac arrest in this particular person, you saw the LED had a lot of thrombus and uh, there was some collateral flow in the distal LED. And uh, after the first aspiration, which is I presume that you did a manual aspiration with one of the export catheters, Correct. Uh, you land up getting some flow and you run an IVUS catheter. On an IVUS catheter, you're seeing a calcif calcification, and this is the HD IVUS you're doing, high resolution IVUS. And you see that there is a, a calcium and there's a calcific nodule and there is a clot associated with it. Correct. And uh, so this is a little uh, intramyocardial sort of compression there. And as you come yep. right here, you start yep. right there. Yeah, okay. Calcium. Now you yep. see that? There is a lot of calcium, right? And then if you keep on going down, keep on going further, and then your haziness. So this is the dropout, and this may be the, your thrombus there. And right. if you see at the nine o'clock position, right? At the nine o'clock position, you see that the calcium, there is a dropout or maybe a little lower than nine, between nine and eight, right? Yep. So why this is not a calcific nodule and then there is a thrombus on top of this. And this is what caused the, uh, the presentation of cardiac arrest and the LED going down altogether. And hence the need for treating this lesion with the stent, which you rightly did. Correct, um, yes. Okay. And then I do understand that there is a COVID positive status, um, which is, you know, we are all are learning about this uh, COVID. And, uh, you know, the more we see, the more, uh, you know, sort of, the variation and more new stuff is there with COVID. And then on the right, right coronary side, you have a haziness 
why can't that be an eccentric track? Um, and that uh, distal vessel, which you're saying is totally cut off, maybe it's just a spasm in such a setting or just happened because the patient was down. It just closed off at that point. Um, I think uh, that is a possibility also, right? Correct. And I think one of the, the difficulty in the ER, we could not get our own EKG because when we turned on the pacer, he did not have any escape rhythm. So we had to go with the EMS EKG that they obtained on route. And right. It was interesting. I understand was, that. Yeah, and there was no, like, uh, I think maybe the reason there was no ST elevation in B1 or V2 was that the early dyad had slow and was given some collateral to the distal LED. So he didn't have any anterior ST elevation. They were mostly... So on the thing. other hand, yeah. so the LED was culprit. And when you open up the LED to restore flow, his rhythm comes back also. Correct. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So his yeah. actually uh, heart block is because of a very large area, which is compromised. Correct. Um, and that has, actually has a very poor prognosis. Um, so I think um, uh, the LED was a culprit and you treated it and I think the patient recovered and did well. Um, did you by chance have a, a point of care uh, echo um, that you guys did in the, uh, done in the ED? No, because he came in by, we didn't actually, because he came in during the daytime and it was a pre, so the AKG was sent before arrival to the ER. So in this case, usually we just take him to the cath lab directly to reduce our door to balloon time. Uh, he just okay. had to stop by the ER. You know, he was covered almost in stool all over his body, so they had to kind of clean him really quickly. In this case, we didn't do a point of care echo, but we usually do it, especially in late cases at night where we're still waiting for the team yeah. to arrive. Right. But in this case, yeah, we did not. It would have been a good addition to, to have. Yeah. To so he case. may have ceased, and that may be a reason that, you know, he, he was incontinent. Correct. Uh, right. Uh, he could have seized with all this stuff which went on um, after his cardiac arrest. It was brain was not uh, perfusing, so all those things are possible. Yeah. Um, Great case. I mean, this is a very complicated, uh, you know, difficult uh, uh, scenario, and then uh, of course made even more difficult with the COVID thrown on top of it. Uh, I agree. You know, the interpretation of this is probably a thrombus on a calcified nodule. Uh, that uh, continued, uh, I mean, that maybe served as a nidus of uh, uh, COVID, uh, you know, with the COVID, it served as a nidus for thrombus formation as well. You know, we, we don't know how the interaction of these two things uh, play into it as well. Now, uh, in terms of uh, long-term management, uh, I, I, you know, I, you know, there was, uh, I, I didn't quite, uh, so you sent him home on aspirin and Belinda, that's it. No, of course, you know, we put him on uh, all the other medical therapies, statin, uh, high intensity, like uh, atorvastatin, no, statin. No, no, no. No other anticoagulant or antiplatelet therapies, no. just aspirin, no. aspirin and Berlinta. Correct. Aspirin and Berlinta only, yes. Okay. You know, yes. given the COVID status, they might, you know, I, I don't know, there might have been some thought given to at least kind of anticoagulation, maybe with a low dose DOAC uh, and maybe drop the aspirin yes. after a month, uh, something like that. Yeah, that's a good, um, that's because a good that's point. you know that's something that you know what happened is very concerning, and uh, you know while that could be the you know it could be just a thrombus on a calcified nodule, uh, you know I'm not you know he did have a major thrombotic episode, and you know in the you know this can repeat itself again, especially in the PE literature, a lot of uh, uh, you know we see a lot of recurrent PEs in these COVID patients as well. And so it may be worthwhile to think about that uh, in at least some of these cases. And with the reason we suspected COVID is he's six year old with absolutely no history and just the, the temporal association with COVID, it made us suspicious. Of course, we can't prove it as the COVID that caused it, but the timing makes the suspicion higher that it was related to the COVID. So I, I think your point is very, very true. Because once he had it once, he might have it again in a different uh, territory maybe. Okay, thank you very much. If there are no further comments of uh, any of the panelists, uh, thank you very much for this presentation. And I think that brings us to the end of uh, uh, this uh, quarterly session of the Fellows and Young Practitioners Forum. I would like to thank all presenters for presenting.
and all panelists for being here as part of this uh, uh, session as well. Thank you all very much, and we will see you in three months. Thank you, Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Okay. Thank you.